my phone got wet when they Gatorade. <laughs> I, I, you know, I wish that I had a uh, video to play of the Gatorade bath. It was really cool. Uh, but what a moment. You guys won there with a, a stop at the one-yard line. Yeah, yeah. What, what was going through your mind that last drive? I, I know I'm sitting here about the vomit watching that <laughs> last, that last part of the game. Uh, first thing was uh, – I, I hope we don't give up a touchdown because we haven't scored a single point in the offense and I called the plays. So I <laughs> didn't want that to happen. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, our defense has been so tough and gritty all season. They've carried us that I felt like as long as we didn't allow a big play, uh, we could get it done. So we got to, I was hoping they would run the ball that last play. We were in a bare front and they did. Uh, but I mean, I was kind of actually emotionless and just numb during that last drive, trying to block it all out. But, uh, it was fun. Well, I'm going to put something up on the screen here. I want you to check this out. Do you see up on the screen the, the graphic that I put, or is your phone too messed up from the Gatorade? Oh, no, I see. I see it. The uh, 1981 Super Bowl goal line stand. Stop. Yeah. Yes, that's Dan Buns against the Cincinnati Bengals. And you've been a lifelong 49ers fan, so you also recognize this. This is Dre Greenlaw. Yeah, Dre Greenlaw against Seattle Hallster. to win the division. Yeah. So I know that most people, probably nobody on this stream was, was watching because it was early in the morning. I was watching, and obviously you were. You were on the sideline. You're the coach of the team. Um, but I, when we talked on the phone a few minutes ago, you said that you saw parallels between this game and the 49ers' first Super Bowl in 81. Yeah, it was weird because, I mean – you know, it's the first time we've been to the championship game. We've lost in the NFC championship, and obviously John Brody had lost some NFC championship games and you know, in his time. And, uh, you know, we went up 20 nothing in 1981. The 49ers went up 20 nothing in that game, and, you know, everything was going great. Then all of a sudden the Bengals, you know, come back in it, and uh, the Niners won that game 26-21, and we won the game 20-14, to and it took a goal line stand to win it. So uh, everything's come full circle. That, that was, it, was a really, it was really cool to win that way. I am going to play some video right now if you want to see. This is of you and after the game, just the look of relief on your face to give our <laughs> viewers a little bit more context. Vienna is the team that has dominated this Austrian Football League for years. And last year you hosted Vienna in postseason and you blew a lead. You, you lost to them in the semifinals. So it, that yeah, obviously yeah. just played on you. What did it mean to get over the hump, to be able to, to to beat these guys for the first time, given the history, given the fact that you had come up short before? I mean, it meant everything. We were the we were the lowest win. I mean, we had the lowest wins of every team in the playoffs. We were like, it was if there was a wild card team, it was us. We started off the season three and four, and uh, the Vienna Vikings have been the thorn in our side for years. Here, the first time we ever beat them was last year. We had lost like twenty something in a row to the Vienna Vikings. We beat them last year in the regular season, then lost in the playoffs, blew a seven-point lead in the fourth quarter. And to beat that team in this game for the championship um, with our defense, PPP has historically been a defensive team. Um, with our defense coming through that, I couldn't – if I had to script it, that would have been the ending. And uh, it means the world, and it's the pinnacle of PPP success. These guys are so happy. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy because it, it did look like it, it was going the wrong way with when they completed that pass down to the one-yard line, but – yeah. Somehow, some way, the guys were able to muster up the, the strength to make a, a goal line stuff. At a point of the game, you know, both you and I were watching the same game. The fourth quarter, the defense seemed like they were getting tired. They were getting gassed. They were struggling. Oh, they were tackle. gassed. Yeah, but when they absolutely had to, there, there was that uh, – they conjured the energy. What was the – was there a message on the sideline? Uh, or, or what was the feeling on the sideline entering that final play? So that – we uh, we got to that fourth down play. We knew they were gassed. They called a timeout after I don't know they were I don't remember specific you know why they called the timeout but they called the timeout and it was a fourth and three, so we knew we need to give our guys a break. I was planning that we had two timeouts and I wasn't going to save them for offense. Our best chance to win the game was to stop them on defense. So I called a time. They called the timeout. I let them get lined up. They went empty. We called a timeout on a fourth and three, and at least gave our guys a little bit of a breather. Um, so two timeouts in a row, and then you know they completed that fourth down pass, got a first down, they got to the one yard line and. When we called that time, when we called when they called their first timeout, our guys came to the sideline, and guys were dropping to their knees, exhausted. Wow! And we had talked about at halftime, you know, there's no tomorrow. Whether we win or lose, we don't have practice anymore. There's nothing to save. We can become legends if we just finish it. 
So the defensive guys in that huddle, we told them, really our defensive coordinator told Nesta Bonavilla, I want to give him the credit because when it comes to calling the defense, talking to these guys in situations, I give it to him. You know, I listen and I don't want to interfere because he's their leader. And uh, he told them, hey, there's nothing to say if we need three plays here. There's 20 something. There's 20 seconds left, I think. We have three plays left. Nothing to save. Everything is on the line. Just put it, you know, put it all out there. And the guys just nodded their head and, you know, they got it. At that point, you're not nervous. You're so tired, there's no room to be nervous. And, uh, you know, they got it done. We uh, went with a bare front in the last play and these guys got it done. So it, it was awesome. Now, the first half uh, obviously was, was a different story. There, there wasn't much to be nervous about in the first half. You guys got off the, such a good start. And I was just thinking with some of the plays that your quarterback was making, uh, some of the four interceptions by your defense in the first half, it, it seemed that this was the game of their lives, and it seemed that they were just so locked in and so prepared for the moment. It, it was like, you know, 49ers fans are watching this show right now to, to give – context and perspective it was like playing the cowboys in the 90s playing the yeah. Chiefs now and coming out and like the niners in the, in the 1995 against the cowboys built that 21 nothing lead right after they had lost to dallas so many times in a row it was their yeah. day it was their moment was there that feeling in that first half that your preparation translated perfectly and in, into how you guys came out in those first 30 minutes there definitely was specifically on defense. Um, we had worked on defense for their offense. They were a passing team and we had worked on a bracket coverage for the best receiver, number 13. And I haven't looked at the stats yet, but we effectively shut him down. And uh, so the preparation for our defense was awesome. And our defensive back, their, their quarterback won MVP, their wide receiver won offensive player of the year. Our American defense back, Jalen Dennis, he won defensive and he was defensive player of the year. And uh, we basically just, game plan for a coverage where he would shadow their best receiver from the safety spot. And he had two picks today. He won the MVP award. Um, you know, he was a, he was a four-year starter, three-year captain at the division three level, his first year as a professional football player. And, uh, I mean, he's got a bright football future in front of him if he wants to keep playing. And I mean, we really, uh, our game plan, the whole game, like, you know, whether we win or lose, it was really going to be dependent on Jalen's play. And, uh, Jalen came through for us. It, it, it was awesome. Yeah, I'm got, glad I got that video of him celebrating right there. And then obviously here's the, the team getting the trophy. These guys love football so much, Spencer. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I go back to, to, to when I visited Prague and, and I saw uh, you, you play against Danube earlier this season on May 5th. It was an awesome birthday present for me to go watch that game. And then after I'm watching these guys, you could see it up on the screen right now, literally yeah. lugging the goalposts off the field. Uh, you know, one of your players is is a trauma surgeon uh, by yeah. night, and then he's a football player by day. The yeah. I don't think that Americans pr fully understand the, the the true passion and love for the game that you see from these players. But to see them realize this goal, given how much it means to them, you have that American perspective now. Uh, yeah. What has that meant to see firsthand the, the the passion and the realization of the objective? The love for these guys, these guys have for football is on another level. Even if it, you know, even with football being America's number one game, uh, I mean, every offensive lineman on our team has a power play tattooed on their arm or leg. So all five starting offensive linemen have a football play tattooed on them. And I mean, there's veterans in this team who have their jersey number tattooed on their calf. I mean, the, it just means the world to these guys. It, it's crazy uh, how dedicated they are to the game. And I mean, we have two doctors on our starting offense. Our left tackle is a gynecologist. He delivers babies by day, left tackle, nastiest offensive lineman in the league by night. He's tatted up too. And he's a doctor. And then, you know, Jacob Oleski, he's our starting veteran wide receiver. Um, he's the, he's a team captain leader of the group. He's a trauma surgeon and he comes to practice and he's, I mean, he, he's humble. He, he wants to be coached hard. He doesn't want us to treat him like, you know, some, you know, like in America, there's some, you know, people that are doctors that maybe, you know, are on the higher end of society or whatever, or at least want to be treated like it. He just wants to be treated like one of the guys. He's one of the guys who takes the bust of the game with us. And I mean, I can't, I can't say enough about the humility of these guys and their passion for football. It's like nothing I've ever experienced, whether coaching college in America or here, you never have to beg guys to give effort. They just give hundred percent effort, no matter what you got to tell them to kind of, you know, relax sometimes so we don't injure ourselves in practice but the passion for football is off the chain out here it's incredible 
Can you tell our audience something about yourself as a coach and, and how you've evolved schematically? We, we've got a lot of football nuts on, on the, the, the channel, which is great because we could talk about football in depth, intelligently. I mean, you grew up watching the 49ers, Mariucci, Owens, yeah. Garcia. We've talked a lot about that, but obviously you just invoked – uh, some some memories of, of the dynastic 49ers as well. How have yeah. Bill Walsh offense and and and, and all that uh, you know influenced you as a coach to what you have run to a championship now with Prague? Yeah. So before I ever started coaching, and I started coaching when I was 23. I'm 33 now. Um, I had wanted to learn the West Coast offense. My dad is a 49ers fan. He grew up watching the 1980s 49ers, and you know. All I could, all I knew about them was watching like documentaries about Ronnie Lott, Joe Montana, Bill Walsh, you know, every all, all of it, you know, and I loved it, and I just and I and I just wanted the Niners to get to a Super Bowl again when I was a kid, and you know, obviously they have since then. And uh, wh before I ever started coaching, um, I would work nights at a hotel, and I uh, downloaded and printed out Bill Walsh's 1985 West Coast offense and learned it, just self learned it. Obviously, maybe not to the degree a coach would, but since then I've been able to put pieces together and actually know it. Now, you can't coach that, like, to that in-depth of a degree at this level or college. you you got to have guys that it's their six-day-a-week job in order to coach that. But definitely the principles of it, you know, are the stuff that I, I live and die by. And, uh, I mean, I love the West Coast offense. I'm a, a West Coast offense, you know, fan. And uh, that, that's really what inspired me. And what inspired me for this game specifically was – I had watched the America's game 1981 49ers story um, a few days ago when they went to their first Super Bowl against the Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, Bill Walsh was talking to him about routine. Do everything the same that you've been doing. Don't like do extra just because it's the Super Bowl. Just treat it like a regular game. And so that was our mantra. Hey, it's the same thing. Just keep it the same. Whatever you do on a Friday night before the game, do that on Friday. Whatever you do on Saturday when we travel, do that on Saturday. Whatever you do Sunday morning, do that. We kept practice the same. We did everything the same. And uh, it worked out. And these guys obviously came out firing out of a cannon and, you know, weren't <laughs> nervous at all. So keeping routine is the most important thing that I learned from Bill Walsh. Uh, don't change stuff just because it's a big moment. Do what you've been doing. Well, you didn't change anything from the 1981 49ers. It, your, your goal line stop. And we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll feature you when we get video of the game because I think people, people will really enjoy the actual tape. I don't have it right now, but it looked a lot like this. We'll just – we'll just uh, – Put that out yeah, there. it looked a lot like uh, yeah, it was, it was dramatic. The, the Bengals. I know that you have to run to the bus, but I got one more, and I'm going to put up. I know we wrote a big article about yeah. you last year uh, in the New York Times. This is it: the the story of football's rise in Prague with surprising 49ers connections. And you know, obviously, you are one of the 49ers connections, being a 49ers yeah. fan. But one of the neat things is that this team was actually founded right after the revolution from communism yeah. in the early 1990s. And the biggest star in American football at the time was Joe Montana. So you've got a lot of guys who are now on the staff. Daniel Krabic, I think, is somebody that I should definitely mention, who was yeah. one of the first quarterbacks for this team. And, and he wore number 16 in yeah. honor of Joe Montana. And then th it turns out they call this the Joe Montana tram, the number 16 tram in Prague. Yeah. So this is this has been a, a connection from, you know, a, a post-communist country to the U.S. And you're a history yeah. guy. You're a history buff. Like, how neat is it to be part of that that legacy now that, that the, the, the program has finally won an Austrian Football League championship? Oh, it's been really cool. And, uh, I mean, this year we lived in a part of Prague uh, – in Prague, I know you know Prague, so it was Prague 5, but we had to take the 16 tram to get to practice. So uh, it was a uh, part of this year, too. Um, so it, it's been awesome because Joe Montana was literally the only guy they knew, you know, when before the Velvet Revolution, when they were under communism, it was hard to get information from the West out here. So uh, Joe Montana was so popular that that's the name that was able to leak through the Iron Curtain. So they knew who Joe Montana was, and they idolized him because of what he achieved in a free society and became – the top football player and they knew about him and they wanted to emulate the Americans. You know, they finally got their freedom and they, Hey, the American skateboard will skateboard. Uh, the Americans have water parks. Let's do water parks. And then the Americans do football, not soccer. They do American football. Let's do that. And uh, so they wanted to emulate, you know, it was 1991 or so they got their uh, freedom and they wanted to emulate the 1980s 49ers. And that's, this team was founded on the dynastic the dynastic 80s 49ers and that was their inspiration 
Uh, well, Spencer, th this is the famous picture that I have to show that I think is, in a way, tied to, to what we're talking about. It's Bill Walsh on the phone with Dan Bunn at his side. And I think, I believe that Bill in this photo is, is on the phone with President Ronald Reagan after the Super Bowl in 19, January 1982. So really, really yeah. neat photo there. And obviously it's cool because you've read all Bill Walsh's stuff and you've, you've formulated a lot of your uh, coaching philosophy on that. So I uh, just wanted to bring that history back. It was really fun to, to cover your team over the course of the past year. We'll obviously keep on doing it, but you guys have what, a three, four hour bus ride in front of you now? Is it going to be pretty rowdy? About five and count for seven. Uh, nobody parties like the checks and uh, there's a, the roads on the uh, the roads on the road. I mean, the rules on the road are a little different in uh, Europe. You can drink in the bus as long as you're not driving it. So uh, these guys are going to party on the bus, and it's completely legal. So it's 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 gonna yeah, it's gonna be a ride home. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Well, say hello to all the guys. Congratulations again. Uh, well deserved, and and I know you 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 went the hard way as well. I know disappointment yeah. last year, so it's been awesome to see this happen for you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. All right, take care, Spencer. Congratulations. Yep.